Okay, thank you. Without delay, we'll start our second panel. And this is on Arrow's broader intellectual contributions. And I don't know if, as you walked in, if you had a chance on your right, there was a table. And on the table, there's a bunch of reprints of Ken's work. You'll see a bunch of articles there. And you'll see an amazing breadth of, of work there. And, and part of what this panel is to do is to fill out the intellectual contributions beyond the four panels that we associate with many of Ken's most well-known seminal contributions. And just to give you an idea, I just pulled two off the table. And the first one, you can see naturally coming out of the first panel, Nozick's Entitlement Theory of Justice. It was pu published in the Philosophical Quarterly of Israel. And the other one then gives you an idea of the, the broader importance that Ken put on the world and it's entitled, The Basic Economics of Arms Reduction. So there was really no topic that Ken thought was important that he wasn't really willing to roll up his sleeves and work on. And that's what our panel here is about. So without further ado, um, we'll start with Mordecai Kurtz. Closer. Actually, I want to take more of a personal direction, some personal reflection. And I actually want to talk about and the discipline of time, I'll read my notes. I actually want to talk about Ken, the person who cared deeply about humanity and saw economics as a practical means of doing good and how this perspective affected his work. Let me start by saying first that what we all know is Ken had a unique and personal impact on people. We all remember the first time we met him. My own personal experience begins in September of 1959, when I, as the statistics graduate student, took Ken's course. We connected well and spent much time talking whenever the opportunity arose subsequently invited me for a postdoctoral visit in 1961, and since 1962, we've been colleagues. Uh, so I spent, I had the privilege of uh, spending 57 intimate years with Ken. Uh, it's a long time. Now, being a man of grace and humility, Ken's greatest joy was his contact with people and the foundations of his human relations were courtesy and fairness. He was open to all and related to each person with the same attention and care. Ken's humanity was revealed mostly in his attitude to public service and to improvement of life by solving practical economic problems. He didn't think positive theory by itself is a sufficient goal for an economist and viewed real economic problems, economic policy, and collective action as the ultimate goal of all economic endeavor. He inspired me with this notion, and that was the spirit with which we worked together two years on a book and some papers. However, I first encountered his view on this subject in a surprising way. Late in 1961, I moved to Stanford for my postdoc. But earlier that year, several of our students, several of our students at Yale had a heated discussion with Charlie Koopmans on the virtue of existence theorems. Charlie was adamant in insisting existence proof is needed to ensure a model at hand is logically consistent. One subject I discussed with Ken after arriving at Stanford was the question of existence of an error to equilibrium. And, uh, and again, the question surfaced, why should we bother with it? Ken's answer was immediate and clear. An existence theorem is the basis for formulating economic policy by explaining why markets, when markets do not work, and therefore collective action is called for. Since this conversation took place in 1962 or early in 1963, you may recognize he was then thinking about insurance markets in general and medical care in particular. His AER paper appeared in 1963, December of 1963. 
Ken's dedication to real problem solving is seen by noting that his initial dissertation topic was the practical formulation of the firm's operation. He didn't do that. That was not his dissertation. He realized this early vision by spending in the 1950s most of his work on developing the theory of inventory and production with an operation research oriented in, in, in industrial application of various program, programming techniques. Breathtaking work, volume of work uh, by Ken and co-authors such as Karf, uh, Uzawa, Hurwitz, Colin, and many others was done just after the Aero de Brew theorem was completed. Ken always believed his most important contribution to Stanford University was his pivotal role in the creation of the operations research department. Another example was the work he did at, at RAND. Ken did some summer work at RAND when one of RAND's, RAND's mission was to conduct research for the Air Force. Once he told some of us how much he learned about the way aircrafts are designed. He then said something like, these astronom aeronaut aeronautical engineers don't even have a model to describe how a new airplane would fly and do not even know if it will fly. They improve them as they build them. So why should we expect a precise model of high economy grows? You may recognize as this is where the learning by the doing theorem was paper was built, was, was born. Even social choice theory is an outcome of Ken's passion for tackling real economic problems, real life problems. So here it is. I already mentioned the fact that Ken had great difficulties deciding on dissertation topic. And in the middle of 1947, he left graduate school without a PhD to join the Coles Commission in Chicago. People there introduced him to RAND, where he was invited to spend the summer of 1948 with a team that studied applications of game theory to war and diplomacy. One day, Olaf Helmer, whom Ken knew from Columbia, raised the question, games are playing, played by individuals with preferences. So how can we talk about a game between the United States and the Soviet Union? Ken told him that Bergson and Samuelson wrote something about social welfare functions. Helmer then asked him to prepare a presentation on how this works. Knowing the voting paradox from Columbia, Ken set up to understand how other mechanisms may work. It took a full week of extremely extensive and intensive work at the end of which the impossibility theorem was born, and the first 20 pages of his dissertation were written out of the need to apply game theory to war and diplomacy. The first course he taught at Stanford after retiring was a course on income distribution, a problem he was very concerned with and a topic I actually personally spent much of last year discussing with him. Most of Ken's time in recent years was dedicated to environment, environmental issues. About a year before he passed away at the age of 95 and already ill, he spent an exhausting time in a remote island in Scandinavia in a conference on environmental policy. He disliked spending time on airplanes and the only complaint I ever heard him express with regard to these matters was the long airplane rides Ken records of public service out of academia is too long for the, to be listed here. I can simply say it's, it's an extraordinary record of it, to extend that from Stanford Senate and advisory board through the Council of Economic Advisors in Washington and up to a commission dedicated to the conquest of malaria. While in the hospital, several weeks before his passing away, Ken asked for a yellow pad on which he had started to write a new paper for the World Bank on the use of general equilibrium in their practical development thinking. David, his son, found the pad and brought it home. He brought it from home. Due to medicines, Ken had difficulties focusing on the writing in the, uh, writing in the hospital, but hoped to write after he goes home. 
He did go home, but he did not finish the paper. Uh, now that he passed away, we will cherish Ken's memory and will carry his goodness in our hearts. His departure leaves a gaping hole that cannot be easily filled. In Jewish tradition, the prayer of Viskar, which is the service of remembrance, is a celebration of generosity, a time to give thanks for the gifts we have received, to discern the blessings bestowed upon us by the life we have lost. I speak for all of us in giving thanks for all of Ken's gifts to us. Thank you. Thank you, Mordecai. Our next speaker is Larry Lau. Uh, thank you. Um, it is a great honor to have the opportunity to speak about Professor Kenneth Arrow in this academic tribute. Ken make path-breaking contributions in almost all fields of economics. As I look at today's program with all the special panels, I did wonder what more I could say. Then I decided to talk about the major contributions that Ken made to the theory of production. Um, first, the Aero Chandler Minhas and Solo, Professor Solo's here, uh, 61 article, uh, which is very well known, uh, was a watershed article in this publication sent the profession off to new directions. It is a masterly synthesis of both theoretical and empirical research. It is a deep and rich article. I always learn something new every time I read we read the article, I reread re it recently. The article demonstrates convincingly that the production technology, whether at the industry or the economy level, is neither the Leon TF type nor the Copdockers type, the two most popular assumptions at the time. The elasticity of substitution between capital and labor varies across economies and industries and can only be determined through empirical estimation. Moreover, if the elasticity of substitution is assumed to be a constant with respect to the relative price of capital and labor, it implies that the production function has the CES form, which can, um, Bob here, independently derived. It is of interest that the cost function corresponding to the CES production function also has the same algebraic form. Of course, if the elasticity of substitution is not a constant equal to unity, then the relative factor share is not constant, but would depend on the relative factor prices in addition to the value of the elasticity of substitution. The elasticity of substitution is actually a measure of the curvature of the isoquant. While it may be a constant on each isoquant, it is not necessarily the same constant across isoquants. Um, it can, in principle, change with the quantity of output as the isoquants move out in the northeasterly uh, direction. Constancy of the elasticity of substitution is also independent of the assumption of homothetricity, and in particular, uh, it does not require constant returns to scale. This can be most easily seen in the CES cost function in which the distribution parameter and even the elasticity of substitution itself can be a function of the quantity of output as well as time. Technical progress can also shift the isoquants and change the elasticity of substitution and not necessarily in a hex neutral way. The value of the elasticity of substitution between capital and labor remains relevant today. Advances in information technology, especially in the areas of artificial intelligence and robotics, have increased the potential substitutability between capital, broadly defined, and labor. Bear in mind that uh, artificial intelligence is actually a form of intangible capital, and a robot is a form of tangible capital. They can make the isoquants in the capital labor space flatter and the elasticity of substitution possibly greater than unity in some industries. However, whether an economy will operate in this region still depends on the relative price of capital and labor. This will also have implications at the macroeconomic level uh, output, employment, investment, and relative shares. Over the past decade or so, the share of labor has been declining in the United States and in some of the other developed economies as well. Um, 
perhaps the rise uh, in the uh, value of the elasticity of substitution to both unity and the declining user cost of capital uh, may provide a partial explanation. We know that computing costs uh, have been coming down and the interest rate is now at all time low. Um, how would one try to identify empirically a change in the elasticity of substitution, uh, whether at the industry or economy level over time? It will require distinguishing capital by vintage. Whatever changes in the elasticity of substitution caused by technical progress can only be embodied and reflected in new capital investment. The accelerated rate of technological obsolescence in recent years may have also hastened the rise in the value of the elasticity substitution on average. In addition, identifying a change in the value of elasticity substitution may also require taking into account the difference between ex ante and ex post substitutability, as done by the late Leif Johansson and also suggested by Ken. Ex ante substitutability is always greater than ex post substitutability. But the data requirements for empirical identification of ex ante substitutability are even more formidable because they require knowledge of potentially adoptable technologies in addition to the adopted technologies at every, at every at each point in time. This is not likely to be possible if the technology has been undergoing significant changes. The above discussion leads naturally into Arrow 1962 article on learning by doing. In this article, can model the effects of learning through the cumulative production of new capital goods so that the vintage of the capital investment matters. Learning by doing may also be regarded as a form of economies of scale, but over the time dimension rather than uh, uh, over the space dimension. It's cumulative output over time rather than aggregate output over a specific uh, over a specified space in a given period. Interestingly, Ken's empirical example of learning by doing taken from the airframe industry shows that the amount of labor required to, pr to, to, pr to produce the nth airframe of a given type and a positive integer is proportional to n raised to the power minus one third. Um, I, I did some simple calculation. It implies that the marginal labor cost of the second unit produced is only 80% of the first. And by the time you get to the eighth unit very quickly, the, the marginal cost is only a half. It's amazing. There is a similar empirical six tens power rule widely used by engineers which specifies that capital cost rises in proportion to the output capacity raised to the power two thirds. These are all very real and significant, but non-homothetic or biased economies of scale. Um, now, the existence of significant learning by doing and the economies of scale effects, whether at the, at the industry or economy level, or even at the firm level, is an inconvenient truth uh, to economists. Uh, since both will in inevitably lead to an eventual monopoly or quasi-monopoly situation, it sets up a possible conflict between public welfare and private profit. We can see it today in the, formation, in the information and communication technology industries where network externalities are an important source of economies of scale. It also raises the question of the optimal government regulatory policy. I think the challenge for us is how to avoid winner take all, but instead try to make all winners. Thank you very much. Thank you, Larry. So our next panelist is Eitan Shashinsky. Thank you. I will talk about three of Kenneth Arrow's many contributions to public economic, and specifically, I will talk about his contributions to cost-benefit analysis of government investments uh, on topics ranging from the conceptual to three important applications. There are many other fundamental contributions uh, of Kenneth Arrow to public economics ranging from utilitarian approach to public expenditures, Rawls's criterion, um, 
the welfare economics of medical care and many, many others. I believe some of these will be covered by other panels today. So the first topic I want to talk about is the pro what is the appropriate discount rate for public investments? Should the government follow the rate of used by private firms? Clearly, in a perfectly competitive economy with no uncertainty, the answer is yes. Otherwise, capital is allocated inefficiently. Then there were many uh, formulas that were developed for imperfectly competitive economies depending on the source of the inefficiency, monopoly powers, externality, and so forth. And, this, uh, uh, and these have been developed and the government will deviate from private firms' behavior. One question remained uh, unanswered at the time, and, error uh, and this was, how should uncertainty affect government investment? Arrow, in a 1970 paper, jointly with his student Robert Lind, American Economic Review, provided the answer to that. And the answer was that since the government has wide, very wide taxing powers to diversify risks, if the project is not correlated, if the investment project is not correlated with other components of income, the government should be risk neutral. This is a stark and very important uh, result and particularly these days when it is talked about government renewing investment in infrastructure, so the criteria, the threshold for government investment, what projects should be adopted by the government is an extremely important topic. Notwithstanding this result, Kenneth Aero has addressed two other major issues. One, the first one I'll talk about is probably the most important public investment decisions nowadays, and that's the one concerned with mitigation of global warming. A, a problem, worldwide problem, where correlation, of course, cannot be ignored. In 2007, Aero published a paper addressing the controversy surrounding the, the well-known Stern Review. Uh, greenhouse gases are lingering in, in the atmosphere for long periods, perhaps as long as 200 years, and therefore the issue of discounting and uncertainty and risk are essential. Uh, the Stern Report follows a considerable tradition in British econ economics, philosopher, some philosopher too, in taking a zero uh, discounting per se for futurity. Uh, Kenneth Arrow did not agree with that approach uh, follow, and cited in his article also Charlene Kupmans and other evidence why this assumption is an extreme and unacceptable assumption. But he took uh, an alternative route which eventually led to the same conclusions as in the Stern Review. Uh, first, he took the various probability distributions that were laid out very meticulously and in detail and for the first time in the Stern Review of various alternative scenarios, climatic scenarios, uh, from catastrophic ones to mild ones. And he calculated that until the year 2200, the decrease of no action today would reduce the world growth rate from 1.3 to 1.2% annual growth of GNP worldwide, and decrease of 20%. Then for a commonly accepted level of risk aversion, ETA, two or around that figure, he, he conducted the cost-benefit analysis and he found that for any time discount rate, pure time discount rate, less than eight and a half percent, an investment of one percent of GDP to reduce, to mitigate the greenhouse effects is worthwhile. Nobody will follow, will, will say that eight and a half percent is, is, is a reasonable one, certainly below that. We can argue about the level. So this was a very stark and clear uh, uh, conclusion in favor of the, uh, the Stern Review's recommendation of investing 1% of world GDP to mitigating greenhouse effects. Finally, I want to talk about Kenneth's arrow. It was mentioned here in passing by Mordecai. Kenneth's arrow uh, war, uh, 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 the battle, anti-malarial battles. Malaria is still today one of the worst scourges, scourges of, world, of the world. Nine mil, uh, uh, one million children, 9% uh, of the world mortality, 
dying and die annually in Africa, particularly sub-Saharan Africa and some in Southeast Asia, of malaria. And the morbidity created by malaria has certainly retarded the growth and the standard of living of these countries significantly. As in the, the commonly used drug uh, against malaria, uh, quinine, a derivative of quinine called chloroquine, was used since 1950, but it became, over time, the mutation of the mosquitoes made it ineffective over time. Other uh, um, drugs were uh, brought in, uh, uh, and, but they became even faster ineffective. Then it was found out that the Chinese had a, an herbal medicine against fever as, as, old, as, as old as 2,000 years ago. And some Chinese researchers looked into this and thought, may perhaps this uh, 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 herb, Artemisia annua, it's called, can be used also against malaria. And the derivative, artemisinin, uh, it's called today, has been shown to be the most effective now drug against malaria. In fact, it is used in combinations called ACT, the artemisinin combination therapy today with another drug to prevent, again, the mutation, to reduce the probability of mutation of the mosquitoes. So this was, but at the cost of $2 a treatment, this was not something which was feasible for the populations in the relevant countries in sub-Saharan -Sub Africa in particular. And the question was both the cost, therefore, and the distribution. The National Academy of Sciences in the U.S. has established a committee chaired by Kenneth Arrow. They looked into the matter and recommended that artemisinin will be heavily subsidized. The reasons given are familiar to all of us, externalities, it's a world, uh, worldwide externalities and, and uh, uh, in, informational asymmetries and so forth, should be heavily subsidized. And indeed, they have uh, received the support of the Global Fund, part of the, uh, of, uh, part of the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, Gates Foundation funds, and the drug has since then been heavily subsidized. So, uh, and then the, the, commit, the error committee has addressed some other issues. The distribution. The distribution through the governments was considered ineffective. And the right way to do it was through small stores down in the African countryside by private vendors, okay? And, and they have against government objections. They have recommended that, and that's what was done. Then came up the issue at 10 cents uh, a treatment, uh, that cheap. It has been used, the ACT has been used also for other illnesses uh, at 10 cents, and not necessarily malaria. And then the committee recommended that uh, a kit, a small kit, diagnostic kit, will be supplied free of charge together with artemisinin, and, and, and this, all this has been a very successful uh, endeavor and implementation. In fact, a recent UN report has shown that the, uh, a decrease of about 50% in infant mortality due to malaria in recent years, and uh, this has uh, therefore been a huge success which we all as economists can be proud of. So not only has Kenneth Arrow made contributions to uh, economics, to economic theory, but also as some others who have started here, some with us here, like Al Roth and others, who make contributions to humanity. I think we can all be proud of. Thank you.